we begin our message with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today to hear your word. We come as sinners, knowing that by ourselves we have nothing to offer, but we come hearing your precious words of life, hearing how you have given us everything through our Savior Jesus. And as we come in this uh, manner, may we recognize the promise that you give to us, the ability that you have uh, through us, that you are able to use us and what we have, sinners and sinful though, it, though we are and though it may be, to your glory. We recognize this and, and I simply ask that you would use me, um, your humble servant, to clearly and accurately proclaim the truth of your word that we might grow in our understanding of this portion of your word and in how um, we bring all that we are and have to you, knowing that you will bless it and bless others through us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just not good enough. Or I, I just don't know enough about the Bible to tell other people about Jesus. I'm just not a, a church person. It's not the way that I'm made. I'm, I'm a little bit awkward or I, I don't f feel like people would be comfortable having me in, in church so I don't want to come. God, how could God use someone like me anyways, especially with my past? Or we're too small of a congregation. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough resources. There are other congregations that are bigger and better than us that can do greater things than we can, why should we even try? There are, are probably a, a million different issues that we could come up with, problems that are out there. We have too many problems and not enough solutions, and you could fill in the blank with all sorts of other issues. And there's no denying, as we look at these things, they're real problems especially to maybe some individuals. There may be specific things to them that are bigger problems than, other, than others. There are problems that present real difficulties that we can't ignore. But there's a big difference between recognizing want or perceived inadequacies or, or crisis and then how we react to those things. There's a big difference between recognizing who it is that we worship and, and who it is we, we live our lives for and to give glory to and how that relates to problems that arise in life and just focusing on nothing more than, than those problems in our life. But at the same time, it, it's really easy for us to get caught up in those problems, isn't it? It's really easy for us to feel inadequate. It's easy for us to think that for those problems, well, we need to be the ones to solve them. We need to be the ones to come up with the solution. It's easy for us then also to worry, to despair, or to, again, just feel defeated and inadequate because we don't see a solution. And if I can't do it, well, then who else can? We have our human measures of success. And when they're not met, well, then it seems like a waste of time. And that's especially the case when it comes to outreach. When we do something, it just maybe seems like it fails. Seems like it, it wasn't done well. Seems like it didn't reach enough people. Seems like what we're doing is a waste of our time and we shouldn't have been doing it all along. But the problem with this reasoning is also really where the focus is being placed because it's being placed on us and the job that we have done or it's, it's placed on our pride and, and the abilities that, that we have or the perceived lack of abilities that we have. It's placed on us and that's the problem because it's not placed on God. It's placed on our, on our ability and not on God's ability. And that's why today as we continue our focus on outreach, it's so important for us to place the focus on God's ability. 
And as we do that today, may we be blessed to know that God provides with what we bring. And we hear this as we listen once more to our lesson from Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from their towns. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. When evening came, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. They told him, We only have five loaves and two fish. Bring them here to me, he replied. Then he instructed the people to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and after looking up into heaven, he blessed them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave the food to the people. They all ate and were filled. They picked up twelve basketfuls of what was left over from the broken pieces. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, not even counting the women and the children. Jesus' dear friend, John the Baptist, had just been put to death. That's the news that Jesus hears as our lesson opens. And he was obviously saddened by this news. John was not just a dear friend, he was also a relative. And so he leaves the hustle and the bustle, he leaves the crowds, and he goes off to be by himself, to a secluded place. He is without resources, he is in isolation, and he is dealing with sorrow. From a human standpoint, Jesus is not in an ideal situation to help others. One could argue that he was the one who needed to be helped. He was not in an ideal situation, or you could even say in any position, to be a support system for other people, to give himself to other people. And that maybe is the most amazing aspect of this lesson. Maybe the most surprising thing that we hear in this lesson is the compassion that he has on this crowd. He leaves everyone to find some time for himself. He needed to grieve. But upon coming to shore, upon getting out of the boat, he sees this large crowd that had followed him. And it was not just a few people. This was an exceptionally large crowd. We could probably completely understand if Jesus had said something very different upon getting out of that boat. We probably could completely understand if Jesus had said, you know, guys, I appreciate you coming, but I really would would love it if if you'd go. I need some time to be by myself. I need some time for me. Can you just give me a couple of days? But that's not what Jesus does. He immediately has compassion on them. His heart goes out to them and he spends the rest of his day with them, healing their sick, healing their stories, listening to them and and talking to them and caring for them. He shows how dedicated he is to those who've come to him, to those who say, I need you, Jesus. He simply does not turn away. And he does this, as we said, until evening. But Upon evening time, his disciples start getting a little bit nervous. I mean, they're in a secluded place. There's, there's nothing around. And here there's a, this huge crowd with young families, with women and children, and, and people that, that needed to get home, needed to get something to eat. They were worried for their well-being. Clearly, this was the time for the group to move on. This was the time maybe past the time for them to be ushered out, to give Jesus some time to to finally grieve, some, some quiet time, and to have them go get something to eat. 
After all, there was no way that this group could be fed. And they bring this concern to Jesus. But Jesus rejects that notion. He tells the disciples, no. He says, they don't need to go, to go away. He says, you give them something to eat. Are you kidding me? You can just both see the look on their faces. You can just both hear the thoughts firing through their brains. We, we have nothing, Jesus. There's no way we can do this. We are too small. We have too little. This is simply impossible. You don't realize what you're asking, what you're telling us to do. And it was not as if these disciples were just a couple of dumb fishermen who weren't able to figure out what they had and, and what, how that was able to help all these people. I mean, in fact, we're, we're told in, in the Gospel of Mark in the same account of this instance, of this event, that they, they did the math. That not even eight months' wages would have been enough money to buy food for this crowd to eat. And all they had was a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish. They could tally the measly resources they had. Their math did not fail them. Their minds did not fail them. But their faith did. They forgot who was standing amongst them. They forgot that here was not just Jesus, the human being, but here was Jesus, the Son of God. This is the one who was talking to them when he simply replies to their comment concerning the measly resources that they did have by saying, bring them here to me. And we know the rest of the story by heart, right? They were fed. Every single one of them. And, and they weren't just fed. They weren't just all given something to eat. They, they ate until they were full. They ate until they couldn't eat any more. And then there was leftovers on top of it. In fact, we're told there was 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And the numbers that he fed, well, we simply don't know. But we are told just how many men there were. That's not counting women and children. There was 5,000 men. Extremely conservative estimates would double that number, recognizing it was probably even more if you tallied up everyone who was there. What an amazing miracle. What an amazing thing that Jesus does with next to nothing. But wait, pastor, you might say. Jesus never has specifically told us to, to do this. You're comparing apples with oranges. It, it simply isn't the same thing. Our situation is different. To which I think we need to ask ourselves, well, how? How? And then look at the things that Jesus has asked us to do. Jesus tells us to go into all the world with his good news, with his word. Jesus tells us that he gives his gifts of the Spirit just as he determines and no, no one will be inadequate. He gives us what we need. Jesus tells us to come to him. He tells little children to come to him. Jesus tells us to trust him. Jesus tells us to test him even in how we give, saying he will always continue to take care of us. Jesus tells us to trust him with all of our hearts and to lean not on our own understanding. Jesus tells us that he is our good shepherd and he will always lead us in the correct path, even when it looks like we might be going the wrong way that he will lead us to those quiet waters. Jesus tells us to be lights in the dark world, to cast all of our anxiety on him because he cares for us. Jesus tells us to keep prayer continually on our lips, to come to him when we are weary and burdened, and he will give us rest. And we could go on and on and on and on with all the things that Jesus 
tells us to do. He tells us to trust in him to provide. In short, Jesus also tells us to bring what we have to him. Just like he did to the disciples, and he promises he will use it. He will work through it. He encourages us to be strong in our faith and to simply know who he is and what he can do. The greatest example you can see every single day in the mirror where he took someone who is spiritually dead in their sin, unable to do anything pleasing to God, and he makes you alive in Christ. He makes you righteous in his sight, able to do works of service that God looks at and he is pleased with. He did that without you at all. We can look at all those things and it might be pretty tempting then to say, well, then what do I need to do? Why do I need to do anything? But the fact is, this lesson also shows us why we should never be cavalier with our offerings or our gifts. That Jesus loves them and accepts them for what they are. It doesn't mean we just sit back on our butts and say, well, God, I'm just going to get out of your way then because you have the ability to do all this, so I'm just going to watch you do what you do and I'll just reap the benefits. It doesn't mean that, but it does mean that we do everything that we do knowing full well who our God is and what he is able to do. Earlier in our worship, we looked at a section from Romans 8. It's listed for you in your, your service folder. Very end of the chapter. It's a very extremely comforting chapter, all of Romans 8, but just, just previous to where our lesson picked up, there's a beautiful phrase which tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, up, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things? The answer is an overwhelming yes. And in addition to all of this, Jesus performs this awesome act of compassion and this wonderful miracle of provision when he was emotionally low, in a secluded place in this sinful world. But that's not where he is right now. Having suffered all that he did on your behalf, giving himself unto death for you and for me, after rising from the dead to put the, the exclamation point on his work of your salvation and mine, assuring us of his triumph over the grave, we're also reminded that he ascended into heaven. And there he is seated on the throne of power in heaven. All things are under his feet. All things he rules for the good of you and of me. He is in even better of a position to assist us. May we simply trust that and know that. Yes, we are small. Yes, we each individually have our perceived inadequacies. We have the things that we struggle with. We have the things that we, we worry about. We have the perceptions which sometimes we place on ourselves or, or sometimes we feel others place on us. We may have money concerns and all kinds of other concerns and, and problems about the future of ministry or even this world. But may that never stop us from bringing all that we have to our God in faith. He will provide for us exactly what we need. Bring them here to me. Jesus says to us as well. God help us to do this very thing. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, may it guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.